Hi, my name is Maxwell Johnson, and today I will be discussing pages 642 through 646 in our textbook. The first issue that I would like to discuss today is the history of mental health and the sexual offender status. There have been two significant sexual, two main statuses in recent history for a sexual offender, the first of which arose in 1937. This arose because of the belief that people that committed sexual crimes were psychologically disordered. During this time, sexual offenders were assigned the status of mentally disordered uh, sexual offender. This designation was important because it meant that people with, that were committed as a sexual offender went to mental institutions rather than to prisons. Um, this was often seen as a victory, as shown in this graphic, where being set free was almost equivalent to being sent to a mental institution. This is probably due to the reality that if you were sent to prison, as a sexual offender, you likely faced physical abuse from both the guards and the prisoners. Um, after this, the next status that I want to talk about um, occurred about two decades ago. 21 states removed the current status of a mentally disordered uh, sex offender and switched to a sexually violent predator or a sexually dangerous person. This switch in status brought upon uh, some court rulings where it was brought to the Supreme, Supreme Court. Upon the ruling of Kansas versus Hendricks, the violent predator laws were upheld by a vote of five to four. Additionally, this switch um, in sta status was very important because it brought pris uh, sexual offenders into prisons and out of mental institutions. So the question is, what caused this transition? Well, there are four main reasons for the switch to the sexually violent predator status. The first of which is that the law is very difficult to apply. In order for it to be applied, you must rule that the person is sexually dangerous uh, to an absolute degree. This is a very hard judgment for a clinician to make and even might be outside their purview. The next thing that is challenging is choosing candidates for treatment. Some states write that in order for a candidate to achieve the mentally disordered psychological or sex offender status, you had to be a good candidate for treatment, which is very difficult to apply considering the severity of these crimes. The third reason that I'd like to discuss is the racial bias and the assignment of the status. Uh, it is, like I said earlier, it is important that you receive the mentally disordered sexual offender status because then you go to a mental institution. But the reality was that white Americans were being labeled this status at twice the rate of African Americans and Hispanic Americans. And the fourth reason that I would like to discuss today is that as time has gone on, there's been less concern for the rights and needs of sexual offenders. This is probably because there has been an increase in the number of sex crimes. This has been shown in the public outrage where people have become more, voice, more vocal and then voicing their concerns about this increase. In addition, it's been reflected in media, in television, and in sports. Uh, one case that I would like to bring to our attention is the case of Jared Fogle, the former spokesperson of Subway. He was assigned the sexual violent predator status because of his allegations that were uh, that he was charged for, in which he was charged for child prostitution, elicitation of child prostitution, and um, child pornography. Because of these uh, charges in the sexually violent predator status, he is now facing 15 years and eight months in federal. switch the next topic I'd like to discuss today is mental incompetence um, I would like you to direct your attention to the figure in the bottom right because this is a great example a great figure to represent what mental incompetence is as you can see there is a lock and a chain around the person's head this is meant to represent that the person is unable to understand the legal charges and proceedings that they are, then that therefore they are deemed mentally incompetent. When you have a mentally incompetent patient, then they are unable to stand trial and unable to prepare defense to uh, go into trial. 60,000 competency tests are taken annually. 20% of those tests result in the mentally incompetent status. Um, if you are deemed mentally incompetent, then you will go to a mental health institution until you are deemed mentally competent. 
One important thing to note is incompetent patients cannot be indefinitely held, where they either have to be deemed or they have to be deemed competent, or another case has to arise. Um, one um, the next thing is important. Uh, okay, and the the man in your top right is named Jared Loner. In 2011, he went on a shooting rampage in Tucson, Arizona, where he shot 20 people, 14 of which were murdered and six of which were severely injured. At following his crime, he was deemed mentally incompetent to meet trial. Because of this, it took 18 months, and then following, finally was able to meet trial with the addition of psychotropic medicine and other psychological help. Once he did reach trial, in November 2012, he pleaded guilty to murder and was imprisoned for life. The next topic that I'd like to discuss is the trends in prison and mental health. The first thing that I'd like to bring to your attention is the uh, percentages increase of, pr the, of mental health cases in prisoners relative to the general population. If you focus your attention on the prisoners of right, you have three different categories, psychotic disorders, major depressive disorder, and personality disorder. And in your first category, you see that there is a 3% increase of psychotic disorder um, among prisoners. There is a 4% increase of major depressive disorder among inmates. And very surprisingly, and most staggering, you see a 41% increase in personality disorders among prisoners. There are also two other important trends that I would like to bring up. The first of which is although we have the image of prisoners in mental institutions, we are starting to see now that it's actually more common for prisoners to have outpatient psychological care rather than mental institution care. And then the final trend that I'd like to discuss is the what type of prisoners are actually being treated for psychological help. And surprisingly, you see that the majority of criminals are actually receiving psychological help for reasons outside the crime and the conviction. More often, it's living their mental, the prison life and problems that arise later because of that, that people are seeking psychological help. Um, the next issue that I'd like to talk about is race and forensic psychology. If you direct your attention to this image on your right, you'll see a face separated by four corners with different races represented. And what's sad about this image is depending on what corner you align with, then you are more likely or less likely to receive psychological treatment if you're in jail. Among, among the, there are social cultural differences in prison psychology. Among the bias, minority groups are more likely to be found incompetent more likely to be referred for inpatient evaluation. When they do go into the inpatient evaluations, they are more likely to have strict security, and there is also a disproportionate percentage of racial, racial minority groups. For example, um, for involuntary committed patients, 42% are African American, 34% are white, and 21% are Latinx, which is vastly disproportionate to when you look at the general population, where you have African Americans occupying 17%, white Americans occupying 61%, and Latinx Americans that occupy 16%. Another topic of interest that I'd like to bring to your attention is civil commitment. Uh, your figure to the left here is a great example of civil commitment in a figure. So as you will note, at the forefront of the image, we have the client that is suspected of mental health problems. And then in your police lights, and then also in your police surrounding, you have a representation of the state. And currently in America, the state has the right to force a person to undergo treatment if they are thought to have a mental health condition that is putting the community at risk. This type of situation is called civil commitment. The one final aspect of civil commitment that is important is that community, where you have community people as represented in the image that are being affected by this person living on the streets and possibly posing, posing danger to themselves. Um, and it's important where the state has, through the parents patriarch, the state has the right to, um, it gives this state the right to protect itself and its community. And that's where this issue comes into place, where if you have, for example, some reasons that might lead to civil commitment, such as danger to self or others, 
reckless action or fear that the community will be harmed by this person, then that state person can either be sent to a mental institution or even in less severe cases to an outpatient care. And that concludes my presentation. I hope you learned something. Thank you.